Renowned American composer Ricky Ian Gordon takes audiences on a deeply personal journey in his opera, The Tibetan Book of the Dead. The work was inspired by his late partner, Jeffrey, a love Gordon lost to the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. This rarely performed opera being presented by Eastman Opera Theater teaches us how to transition from life to death without fear. I met with Ricky Ian Gordon, who was in residency at Eastman, to learn more about the story behind the opera and its intended impact on audiences. Take a look. Ricky, you have long been recognized as one of America's leading composers for operas and art songs. And everyone from Renee Fleming and Judy Collins to Audrey McDonald and Kristen Chenoweth, among many, many others, they have performed or recorded your songs and your work. And I don't, I'm not aging you, I'm just asking, after decades in this craft and in this field, what is it that still intrigues you and inspires you about what you do? I still love the human voice and nothing makes me happier than giving a singer with a beautiful voice something beautiful to sing to extol their virtues. And I love poetry and I'm still compelled by words. When I see beautiful words, it's like I, I want to enter them into my hard drive and I want to absorb them. I have a natural feeling that I'm not intelligent enough and it's as if every time I set those beautiful words to music, I'm somehow making myself worthier. Well, were you, were, tell me, were you the, the eight-year-old kid who said, one day I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna write these songs and they'll be sung and performed and they'll inspire people all over the world? Or were you like, I see myself going down a very different route? I was not that kid. I, <laughs> for, I didn't even become a composer, really, until I went to Carnegie Mellon. And I went there as a piano major. And it wasn't until a few months when I was a parent major and thought, I had this revelation that really the reason I played piano was to explore the ideas of all the composers I loved with my hands. And I just had this thought, like, maybe I'm a composer. And it really was. I mean, I, I feel lucky because I'm not sure everybody has one of those moments. It was a moment of such revelation. It was like I walked into my own light and my life was never the same again. Well, you are in Rochester right now. Yes. And you are in residency at the Eastman School of Music, where you're working with students on a fall production of your opera, The Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I understand that I was told this was the very first opera that you ever wrote. Is yes, that correct? Yes, it was. So for people, I know this is inspired by the, the book, The Tibetan Book of the Dead, for people, that text rather, for people unfamiliar with it. How would you describe its power and its purpose, that text? Well, first of all, it has lived forever, right? It's an ancient text. But it's important to say, first and foremost, that obviously the thing we all like to sweep under the carpet is death. And yet everybody dies. The Tibetans believe that if you spent a part of every day meditating on your own death, that you would actually live your life more completely. So what the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, is that the Tibetans don't believe we die. They believe everything is a transition. And the transition is called the bardo, which means in between. So there's a bardo. You and me are in a bardo right now. We're between death. We're between life and death. But when you die, you're between death and life. And you have choices in the bardo, according to the Tibetans. Either you can go straight to the light, straight to enlightenment, so that you never have to come back in a body and do this again, you know, and listen to our president lie or anything like that. Sorry, edit that. Or, you, um, or you're on a journey where you're pulled in a thousand directions. The Tibetan Book of the Dead exists because they believe after the person dies for three days, right, um, the book should be read aloud to them to help keep them on the right path so they do go to the right place, so they're not pulled in the wrong direction, so that they do either go to the light or if they come back, they come back in a good body, in a good life, right? Like, I, uh, I joke, but like they're born in Santa Barbara with money. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but that kind of thing, they believe so. It's, but it ends up being the Tibetan Book of the Dead is really a guidebook for both bardos, because even in our lives today, we are pulled in a thousand directions and we are all trying as hard as we can to stay on the right path and to be clear thinking and clear feeling. 
but there are a thousand distractions, including the million we make up in our own mind. That is what the Tibetan Book of the Dead exists for and what it's about. And in this opera, that, that journey is dramatized. When it opens, we see a reader with the book, and he looks at the audience and he says, Oh, you who have come to this place, sisters and brothers, friends, this person is dying. She has not chosen to do so. She is suffering greatly. And then they take us through what happens to the body when it dies, and then a sort of welcome to being home, a new home, the home out of the body, and then the journey begins through the bardo until it ends with rebirth. Why was it important for you to translate that text into an opera? In, in the 90s, okay, pretty much the, all the 90s, I was deeply in love with and in a relationship with a man named Jeffrey, Jeffrey Grossi, and he was ill. When I first met him, on our first date, he told me he was HIV positive, and I had this revelation. I thought, I'm going to love him right out of the world. And when someone had AIDS at that time, they were really incrementally taken from you a little bit each day. And at one point, Jeffrey was in bed with his little glasses reading, and he, he basically asked me if I would help him die as a Buddhist. He had been reading all about Buddhism, and he wanted to die as a Buddhist. He wanted the help of these teachings. And I said, yes. And so I began studying Buddhism. And I read an English translation of the Tibetan book called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by So Gyal Rinpoche. The book astounded me. And at the same time, David Gockley from Houston Grand Opera asked me if I would write an opera for that company. And somehow I told him that I was reading this book for Jeffrey, and he said, why don't you make an opera out of that? And within a day, I found the playwright Jean-Claude Van Italy, who had made a play out of it in these terse, concise 17 scenes, dramatizing it. Within a day, I had my libretto. And Jean-Claude, by the way, American Buddhism, a lot of the Buddhism we know about now is all from the Shambhala publications, from, from Trungpa is the... Um, the, the guru that, and Trungpa lived with Jean-Claude in Rome, Massachusetts. So Jean-Claude knows from where he speaks. So then I had Jean-Claude looking over me, helping me write this piece. And remember, Jeffrey was often in bed within my vision as I was setting these teachings to music. So it was a very deep time. It premiered in Houston. Jeffrey came to Houston, got too sick in Houston to even see the opera, we had to send him home. I had to swaddle him in a blue blanket and hand him to the stewardess. But then it went to Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia he came, he wore a little blue dust mask. Um, the whole cast started to cry when they met him because they knew the whole opera was about him. And um, I introduced him at the Philadelphia pr premiere after the opera and said, this is the muse for the piece. And he died like a month later. What is it like for you, knowing the, this, this rich, uh, per, very personal story connected to this, and then you come to the Eastman School of Music and you're working with some phenomenal students here. How do you work with them to kind of uh, translate to them the meaning of this and what they're doing? I'm sure it's, it's not too, too difficult given that they're, they're thrilled that you're here, but I would imagine that there are some, some sensitivities maybe in doing that. There's, first of all, it's important to say that we are, here we are, 22 years after the opera premiered. So obviously I locked this opera in my deepest cabinet until I was ready for to even face it again. Bubble of illusion, because you want to go bubble of illusion. What is surprisingly beautiful about being here is, first of all, it's not that hard to imbue them with what should be behind the notes they're singing because this story is so real for me, the minute I begin telling it, it's no lie, and it's obviously still so resonant inside of me that I think it becomes redolent for them, and it goes into their work. I also think um, that the importance of it to actually talk with them about 
everybody has lost someone or everybody is afraid of losing someone or everybody is afraid of dying. When someone you, someone you love dies, you have to help be a part of guiding them to the right place. Is so to talk story? about this How is a manual created to make that, that whole idea more peaceful, more beautiful, more believable, and more manageable. So it's, it's all those things. Um, but most important, what has been really beautiful about being here, and you know, I'm finally, I'm in a, new, I'm in a relationship with someone I love now, and he's the, uh, con he's the editor of, of uh, C Consumer Reports magazine, the executive editor, Kevin Doyle is his name. But what this brings back to me in a huge way is Jeffrey. The minute I started hearing the notes, it was like, I always had this feeling that the morning that Jeffrey died, which was in my lap with me singing from this opera to him, and it was as if he breathed himself into me. And I felt as if I had become henceforth two people, myself and Jeffrey, like he breathed himself into me. And for days, I even spoke in his voice. So as soon as I started hearing this opera here, it was like, oh, remembering who I am, remember who, re remembering who half of me is. The next day, I really couldn't help myself, and I sent the cast, I sent everyone a picture of Jeffrey. I just wanted them to see who inspired this piece. Um, so it's been a big experience, and it's no mistake that at the end of the second time I heard the opera yesterday, that somehow Wilson Sutherland, who works here as one of the pianists and coaches, his instinct was to take me to see the sunset on Lake Ontario because the minute we were by that water, it was, it was as if my spirit needed room to stretch out. Like we had been in this little room looking at this opera and I was so overwhelmed with feelings. And then there we were at that vast body of water. And I just breathed and felt like, oh my God, this is a big moment. And not an easy one either too, because by the way, it's a hard opera. This is a story about empathy and compassion more than anything else. It's not easy. I don't even write like this anymore. I wrote the way I felt the Tibetan book needed to be set to music at that time. So there's also a lot happening for me critically and trying to make it right on every level. The Eastman Opera Theater presents the Tibetan Book of the Dead with music by Ricky Ian Gordon from November 1st through 4th at Kilbourne Hall.